All right. Um, this chapter starts out with this image. Uh, if you remember, well, beginning of, of the semester, I showed you a number of maps where the the color green was was um, you could tell basically if it had been old growth forest or new growth forest. I don't know if you remember that first day when I was showing you. I was showing you deforestation. Um, this image from the text. Uh, there, well, there's a specific area that is marked off as a preserve specifically, right? So that defense, not only as a defense, but it's actually uh, guarded by people. Uh, and so you can see a real distinctive, you know, line around where where that is, right? Uh, it's kind of interesting. And now it's not that this area isn't green and have, hasn't had stuff grow back, it's just all new growth, right? All new growth. Uh, so it's not the, the complex ecosystems that were part of the old growth. <clears throat> um, we were talking about biomes a little bit last chapter, so we're just kind of going in more depth into each of the biomes. <clears throat> this always takes two, two button presses. Um, so Earth used to have, uh, obviously, well maybe it's not so obvious, a lot more trees than it has today, right? Uh, trees have been a very useful resource for humans. Uh, we can construct things out of them. We could keep warm with them, right? Um, so big demand for trees, and the demand has always been uh, for more than, well, a sustainable amount, right? Mm -hmm. So we can cut down trees, uh, and a lot of the agriculture that has been started up is areas that used to be forested. <clears throat> Minnesota is uh, one of those same examples. We used to be very heavily forested. Um, was cut down. One of the kind of ironies is, uh, you know, you might think to yourself it was cut down to build this city, uh, but it wasn't. Our forest was cut down to build cities toward the east. Uh, so, any benefit us that way. <clears throat> um, so the section is trying to, this section of the book is trying to draw parallels about well, knowing, knowing that there are areas that are forested, but also it's those dense ecosystems that took uh, thousands and thousands of years, uh, those are the things that, are, that are, you want to lean toward preserving, because um, a lot of the new growth stuff, uh, that's kind of happened in lots of places, and they just don't have the, the density of biomass. All right, so biomes, where are they? Well, if you remember all the study of climate regions, they're very similar, but biomes uh, take into account basically all the biomass and the type of biomass that are in each of those climates. You can kind of think of it that way, right? So things like, well, if you're in a grassland, right? You have very, very specific uh, things that repeat. Uh, in a nutshell, actually, when we're going through the different types of biomes, they're basically categorized by uh, how much precipitation they get or don't get. Uh, there is an also a classification due to general temperature changes, uh, but I would say that the moisture is kind of a more important factor. Um, there's traces of a lot of the different forests that we used to have here and there, especially if there's uh, parks. Um, but again, those are disrupted now by, by large urban developments. Um, well, actually, this is another good good reminder about how what we're seeing it. It's this is basically goes by moisture level, right? Um, typically, the more moisture in an area, and usually that's also the, the warmth. The more warmth an area has, the more biomass it has. The less moisture, that biomass is shrinking down, and then the colder on top of that also shrinking down. I mean, just show you picture examples of all this stuff. It's gonna come up a lot of it. Um, so again, the climate zones. Uh, Coppin is is the classic uh, climate zone categories. They very much correspond with biomes. Um, so climate zones. You know, we got a lot of things going on here. We got that kind of constant sun coming down and rising air mass. So you have in general, lots of tropics and rain. When the air comes down, right? As it rises, it comes down, it's dry, right? 
but the desert, desert belt gets kind of interrupted by mountains and things like that. You know, we have a great big set of mountains that kind of disrupts that pattern. Um, and then the further north you go, of course you get cooler as you go, and that's the main kind of determinant of the differentiation as you go north from that point. Climate zones, uh, biome zones. Uh, again, a little graph from the book, looking at, uh, well, you could see all the different biomes that we have, uh, just adjust how much moisture, what the temperature is, sliding scale. Low latitude biomes. Has anyone been anywhere that was a tropical, tropical rainforest? Um, well, like I said, I'll just show you some pictures and stuff. Uh, what I'm going to show you is a, a, a mixture of, of different climates. Some of them are tropical rainforest, some of them are seasonal, uh, some of them are savanna. Uh, and I'm going to show you Costa Rica, which is a small place, uh, but within Central America, because of the mountains, there's lots of what are called microclimates. So when you look at a big map, go back to. All right, you look at a big map and it looks like these kind of big, broad classifications. Uh, but you have all kinds of actual different climates in these, because you have these mountains going all along this way, right? Tropical rainforest, right? We're starting out with basically the most uh, biomass, the most biodiversity, uh, the kind of thickest uh, mixture of plants and animals that we basically know of. Uh, more so than even a swamp, which has a ton of biomass. Uh, and of course, swamps can be part of tropical rainforest sometimes. Um, gonna take us here to Costa Rica. Um, you can see that there's a few different climate zones kind of all over in this region. Oops. Uh, um, so in these mountainous areas, the, the climate and the biome can change so quickly that you can actually have completely different types of crops uh, at different altitudes. Uh, and so you can actually, in a, in a climate that you would think would just categorically fit into one thing, uh, you could have cold weather uh, crops, like actually carrots tend to be a cold weather crop, things like that, just have them a bit higher up in elevation. Uh, just another graphic representation of uh, the similar thing. Uh, I will say on a number of these mountains, we had that same process. If you remember orographic precipitation, where, well, wind and, 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 and cloud patterns kind of hit a mountain and it's pushed up. And when it's pushed up, it's like squeezing the sponge of the air. And then when it comes down the other side, that's another reason why you could have all these different microclimates. You could have an area that's another side of a mountain uh, that may just get a slight amount of seasonal precipitation or might not. Lots of microclimates. Um, actually, well, I've been going to Costa Rica for a, a good long time. I mean, I'm actually done these lights. Um, one of the newest things that they're doing, there's a lot of construction, because there's a lot of development. Uh, Partially because actually a lot of people all around the world are moving to Costa Rica because it has low expenses and lots of, well, lots of nature. They don't have a lot of fossil fuels, so that's why they're turning to things like wind power. Um, you know, countries that have or don't have fossil fuels, it's really just a roll of the dice. And there are some that just don't have any. And then it's, it's a big quandary of like, well, how are you going to develop and have electricity? Um, this is a this example of the the cloud forest uh, showed you in, in in earlier books of when the air mass is being pushed up a mountain um, it will precipitate out and you can have areas of the mountain that the trees actually get more uh, moisture just from the clouds uh, condensing on them uh, even more so than rain. One of the other interesting things about this region in all the microclimates. Uh, Development, uh, if people have the option of building just slightly up in elevation, it can actually be much cooler and much more comfortable to live. 
Um, and there could be, in a number of countries, there's kind of a class hierarchy because you tend to have to be able to have more money to actually build high up like that. Uh, but you know, from a plane, I can just kind of see it all. This is a little suburban sprawl, which is happening just kind of everywhere, not just in the US. Um, some areas was the dry season. Uh, they have a good size amount of water in their water table, so they could usually irrigate. Sometimes they'll let fields go during the dry season, uh, just because it takes so much water. And actually, this type of irrigation, with the sprinkler system, uh, it wastes a lot of water. Um, the thing that's kind of uh, going over in lots of places with climates like this is uh, drip irrigation, where you have uh, you have like hoses and whatnot under here, and they kind of have little holes in them, and they drip out little amounts slowly under the ground for the roots. Because with this system, uh, like a ton of it evaporates as soon as it's as soon as it's going out, right? Um, see now this is, it keeps on going two in a row. So I was flying over and I saw an example of why is it going twice in a row? Uh, you know, there's there's a fair amount of uh, burning, um, and it kind of depends on the, the place you're at or whatnot. A fair amount of this is uh, slash and burn agriculture, uh, which the book talks about specifically in this chapter. I don't remember if I've described slash and burn agriculture very much. Um, well, it is what it sounds like, slash and burn agriculture. Um, in the forest, in the rainforest, because there's so much rain and precipitation, uh, the nutrients and whatnot get washed out of the soils. Remember, I kind of talked about that a little bit before. Um, so what indigenous populations did uh, for many generations is, um, well, you go out to the rainforest and you just have a little section, you cut it down and it dries out kind of quickly and so you set it on fire before uh, a rain comes. Um, and then that ash, can be used as a fertilizer as your soil for like a number of years. Uh, it's not long before that gets washed away and you gotta move on. But if it's small groups of people, like that's a sustainable thing you could do and they did. They sustainably did that for generations and generations. Uh, these days, like the term is used slash and burn agriculture, but it usually is just cutting down the rainforest and setting it on fire and then switching that to agriculture forever. Uh, and that itself has very mixed success because, um, <clears throat> you know, when you burn down the rainforest and you're creating an area for agriculture, um, like I said, that ash could be used as fertilizer, but after a couple of years that washes away and then you need to have the money for herbicides, herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers. You gotta have the money for all the stuff if you're gonna keep your crops going. Uh, and usually what happens is the people can't afford to do all that. And so it turns, it just turns into grazing land. And so now you have these huge amounts of grazing land uh, that are like, they're not the forest, but they're not desert. So it's like, well, uh, new road going in here. I think I mentioned before about the red color of soils uh, in the tropics. Um, it's just a, an example when there's new roads going in, it could look like almost a gory red. Um, but that's just minute particles of, of metal that have rusted in the soils because it's so much rain. Um, but it will fade through time, uh, especially after they pave it over. Similar to lots of areas around the world that have coasts, there's a lot of uh, a push for development along coasts because they're very scenic. You know, you have a nice beach here. Um, but increasingly these areas are extremely low elevations, are just barely above sea level. Uh, and so these are some of the areas that when a big storm does hit, a hurricane or whatnot, they're very vulnerable. Uh, but like I said, increasingly construction is happening in these areas. If they're in an area that has not had a bad hurricane in like 50 years, people just kind of get a feeling of, of oh, it should be safe now. But it's like, well, you're probably in a 50, 50 year hurricane zone where you're just gonna get another one any day now. <clears throat> a little bit of sprawl. Um, like I said, it was the dry season. Uh, 
The circles are central pivot irrigation. We do some of that in Minnesota too, where you just kind of have a big thing that goes around and, and sprinkles. Uh, as you can see, they decided to leave a number of their fields uh, to just dry out, because in the dry season, gotta conserve your water resources a little bit, a little bit. A little bit of sprawl and development. Like I said, a little bit up in elevation, even if it's just a little tiny bit, uh, much cooler. Um, especially if it's on the other side of a mountain, the dry side, right? Um, there's a ton of agriculture in Costa Rica, um, and Costa Rica does have that money for their agriculture to have lots of herbicides and pesticides uh, and fertilizers to keep it productive, but that also means a ton of it washes off because you're in a tropical, tropical climate, right? So you're gonna get rain all the time. Uh, so you get, you get uh, unfortunately, a lot of the sediment washes on the coral and, well, I mean, it sucks to kill coral as it is, but also Costa Rica has a huge tourist industry and it's really in their interest to kind of like keep the coral thriving to some extent. <coughs> and all this is still me just uh, flying over it. Um, so a map of the, the main tropical rainforests around the world, but like I said, you could have uh, little examples kind of all over nearby, depending on microclimates. Um, but this is where the main areas are. Yeah. All right, back to some overhead views. <clears throat> um, one thing actually has changed in Costa Rica through time uh, because they have a, a big mountain range that kind of cuts the country in half, um, through time, the two sides kind of were, were a bit independent. Uh, and as far as trade and whatnot, it'd be difficult just to move things from one side to the other. Uh, but they started putting in a series of tunnels, which uh, are real time savers and have kind of brought the, the economy of the country together. Um, graphic representation from our book uh, of the rainforest and why it has so much biodiversity, why it has so much biomass because uh, of the thickness. Uh, and this is, <clears throat> well, what else would I, would I point out from this? I'm just going to show you some examples of a lot of this uh, in the real world. Um, so back to Costa Rica. A little bit into agriculture. Uh, can people tell what this crop is? I think. Cotton. No, they're not. They're not growing cotton in Costa Rica. Slightly closer view. Corn. No, this is pineapples. Pineapples. A big crop. Um, you know they're not like on not like apples on trees. They're they're little little guys, and they've been bred to be a little compact, so they're easy to farm. Uh, people can probably tell what crop this is. This is kind of the biggest crop in Costa Rica. Bananas. Bananas. Good bet. Uh, yeah, bananas. Um, so in this area, I don't know if you can see the guy pulling these, uh, but they have. They put these blue bags on them when it means they're ready for, for harvesting. Uh, and then they kind of come through and put them on these hooks. Um, they have a, a bit of a complicated system. So in, in ancient times, before modern agriculture, bananas were usually farmed with a mixture of different crops. I think I might have mentioned before, if you plant and this would be very labor intensive because this would be humans who would be having to maintain it. You'd have your banana tree and you would plant, um, you know, you could plant chocolate crops, you could plant beans because that'll put nitrogen back into the soil. You plant different things, yada, yada, yada. Our modern agricultural age is more about monocrops, monoculture. Uh, and so if you go to Costa Rica, for example, uh, if you're driving around, you'll just go by just like fields and fields of banana plantations as far as the eye can see. Uh, not unlike, I guess, if you're driving out here and you see fields and fields of corn. Um, but what they have going on here, they don't have the different crops. And what they do is their system is set up so that they have 
each little area has three banana trees going at the same time. Usually there's one that has been chopped from the last uh, harvest, and then you have one that's ready for current harvest, and then you have a, a sprout for the next harvest. So what they have is each little clump has three harvests a year. Um, now, traditionally, it would be one harvest a year because that's just kind of how nature would go. Uh, but modern day agriculture, um, they do indeed use lots of herbicides and pesticides and fertilizers to maximize the growth so that you get uh, three banana crops a year in this case, in this example. Um, but like I said, if you're driving, you just go buy them and buy them. <clears throat> um, This chapter is talking about uh, deforestation, specifically in the Amazon, quite a bit, um, because it's the biggest of that old growth forest that really exists. Uh, some areas of Brazil, uh, especially this area, uh, was always quite drying, was a seasonal forest, but now that this has been deforested, we're getting some amount of uh, desertification, where you have areas that used to be a different climate. Um, but it's kind of slid into this, this other type of climate. Um, I'm going to show you some examples of what, what's called ecotourism. Ecotourism is if you're going on a tour, uh, but you're trying to not damage that ecosystem. This is kind of a new and vogue, uh, way to tour. Um, so I'm going to show you some of that that I did in Costa Rica. Uh, this is Kuru. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to show you an area that is a, a monkey preserve. It's a monkey preserve in Costa Rica. Costa Rica has really, really aggressively tried to protect the force that it has left. It's one of the few countries that has been really aggressive in that uh, in lots of different ways. This is an old house of uh, the person who who used to own this kind of large area of land that is now a monkey sanctuary. Um, it was a family and the younger generation moved off to the city and kind of got, got city jobs. And there was just one old lady that was still living on this property. Um, and she's the one who wanted her property to change into being a monkey sanctuary. Uh, and so this is her original home, so it's still there. <clears throat> um, as well as as you would think, many monkeys in this monkey sanctuary. Uh, this is just an example of how, when I talked about the soils being leached of their nutrients, often the only real kind of nutrients that are on the forest floor is all the rotting vegetation that has fallen. Um, that's kind of like as, as much as you can get as far as developed soils. Uh, here it was like all rocky right under. <clears throat> Uh, I'm also going to show you in these examples how uh, the tropical rainforest, about how the, the roots really hold the landscapes together. And then when you deforest, you're not just losing the trees, but you're losing uh, how much they held the landscape together. Put it that way. Uh, typical thing to see in the tropics, termite mounds. Uh, they're, they're edible if you're ever very hungry and you're in the tropical rainforest. All you do is just, you just put your, your finger on it and they'll swarm your finger like it's an invader. And they just go out like that. And they taste like mint. Uh, no one's ever eaten insects on trips. Well, maybe future, future adventures. Um, so as we're walking through, although this is a monkey preserve, it's not specifically a forest preserve. Fair amounts of it had been chopped down. This is before it became a preserve. Uh, there are some old growth trees here and there, uh, but lots of the areas that kind of look like this are areas that used to be forested and now they're just kind of, like I said, when it shows green on the overhead map as far as vegetation, uh, a lot of it is just like this, which isn't anything compared to a tropical rainforest, right? Uh, as you can see, the signage is not great at this. Uh, I would say they, they don't have a very large budget, uh, but also, uh, things just erode very quickly in the rainforest. You have a lot of hot temperatures, a lot of rain. Um, and again, this was the dry time of year, so the water level is very low. 
Uh, but this is yet another example, like I said, of how the trees and whatnot are, are holding the landscape together. Um, so this, as I said, it's a monkey sanctuary. Uh, I know that's not a monkey, it's a goat. Um, well, this is a little penned up area where, let's press this a million times and then maybe hold forward once. Uh, so anywhere in Costa Rica, if there's an injured monkey and someone comes across this injured monkey, you know, it's like, it, in Minnesota, you know, maybe someone will come across an injured raccoon and they'll think to themselves, you know, well, what do I do about this injured raccoon? And you kind of call your local conservatory organization and they'll tell you what to do with it, that kind of thing. Maybe you haven't experienced that. Well, in Costa Rica, uh, if someone has a, an injured monkey, uh, they just come across it. Um, they, they can donate it to the sanctuary, but before it's introduced to the rest of the monkey population, it needs to fully recuperate whatever injuries it might have. So it goes in this little area that's fenced off. Um, and the reason they have a goat here is just because the, the goat's purpose was to keep all this grass down uh, by eating it. But I don't know if you can see, he basically eats a trail that goes to the gate. And then, uh, well, he doesn't eat all this grass because the monkey feeds him his bananas. So he's not really, so this is the monkey who's recovering. Uh, as you can see, there are, there are pals that if they hang out. Uh, like I said, the monkey feeds him his bananas so that he doesn't have to resort to eating the grass. <clears throat> um, oh, actually, so the guy in the middle, Marco, he's, my guide, um, we met in grad school, he got his degree in geography. A lot of people who get their degree in geography go into tourism. Uh, I guess that makes sense. Uh, but if you, if you travel with a geographer, you're gonna spend a long time with them taking the perfect picture of everything. Just FYI. Um, a little bit in the forest, a little bit of the wildlife. Um, like I said, this was a, a monkey sanctuary. Uh, so you could see, they don't really want you to feed the animals yourselves because uh, there will be monkeys just kind of all over. <clears throat> um, they also have other touristy things that people do. You could go snorkeling and diving and, and stuff like that. Um, I would say one of the other interesting things about Costa Rica is they went through a very large public education campaign to try to get people basically to stop littering. Uh, littering is, is a surprisingly huge problem around the world because uh, it's usually expensive to clean up stuff and it's very cheap and easy to just litter, right? It's like, oh, no cost to me and to throw some stuff on the ground. Uh, well, Costa Rica, like I said, they went through this great big campaign uh, and then they started putting these things kind of everywhere so that you could recycle and uh, compost and things like that. Uh, and. When they first did it, people weren't really doing it, but they really came around through time. Uh, this is a group of college students just evaluating this specific sanctuary uh, needs to have a certain number of evaluations from visitors to get its grants from the government to kind of stay in business. Uh, oh, and I know that there are signs everywhere saying, don't feed the, don't feed the monkeys. The old lady that I was talking about, this is where she lives now. And she's down here in a wheelchair, but she's allowed to feed the, the monkeys. That's one of her, her big conditions for giving this over to be a, a monkey sanctuary is that she still gets to, because that's all, she just really likes to feed the monkeys. So. Uh, this is, uh, well, like I said, they're, they're preserving their forest and you're, you're not allowed to, to cut down the forest as part of that preservation. But this tree, they are allowed to cut down if they come across it anywhere. Uh, people know what kind of tree this is? Bamboo. Yeah. Uh, why are they allowed to cut that down? Yeah, it's from the other side of the planet, right? Um, it was brought over during colonial times. Uh, 
some some colonials from Spain. Uh, well, they they came across it in adventures uh, in Asia and found it to be a very strong wood and a very fast growing wood. And so they just were like, well, we'll bring that over and we'll plant that in Costa Rica. Well, it, it is strong and it does grow fast. It grows so fast that it squeezes out uh, local uh, vegetation from different ecosystems. And so they actually often will encourage people to cut down as much as you come across because it, it's, uh, it's, it's a, a harmful weed at this point rather than a useful thing for, uh, for its wood product. Um, like I said, they get, they have to go through an evaluation process uh, because uh, they don't get enough money from tourism to kind of stay in business. Uh, it's just too many expenses. Uh, all right, that was Kuru. I'm going to show you some of Montezuma. I know this is Montezuma, but that someone, someone graffiti this sign. That's what to say Montezuma. Um, you would know what Fumar means in Spanish. Yeah, um, it's supposed to be a play on words because Montezuma is uh, a different type of community that involves a lot of people smoking, we'll call, say it that way. All right, let me show you this again. Um, as I was driving around, I did come across uh, some logging here and there. Uh, there is still, uh, still that. Um, and also, well, as I was traveling, I'd always try to get my guide to point out areas that had been forested, just to kind of get an idea of what they're like now. So again, this on an overhead satellite would be green, it'd be the lighter color green. Because um, like I said, when these, when they're not able to have it be agricultural fields, they just change it to grazing land. Uh, and so a lot of, a lot of countries in this region uh, have lots of beef exports, uh, just because they have so much grazing land. Uh, garbage pickup. Uh, I would say the really interesting thing about Costa Rica is they have a lot of tourists who are not temporary tourists. They're there for like three to six months. That's how long they'll be there. Um, and they will have, you know, we talk about the human footprint on the rainforest and whatnot. A lot of the specific types of tourists who come here, they, they believe in low impact. So like they'll just bring their own tent and they'll live in it for months and they'll just kind of like bathe on the beach um, and just kind of like live a, a, a low stress life, I guess I would say, uh, in the time that they're trying to stay there. Uh, this is where I stayed because I'm not gonna be living in a tent for three to six months. Uh, a little nicer. Um, I actually been staying at this place for many years. Uh, they have kind of more of your normal touristy things, um, you know, special drink nights and whatnot, but also lots of tours to go see specific uh, animals. Uh, in the, the rainforest, another thing that you'll see that's unusual for someone from our climate is uh, very often, trees will drop branches uh, and drop roots from branches. Uh, and that's how they kind of grow, but that's also how they kind of st stabilize themselves in a climate that has lots of rain, sometimes has great big monsoon rains. Um, and this is also, rather than like dropping seeds, because they would just all be washed out to the ocean right away, they, they will drop these roots, which will then sprout off their own new trees. Like it's just kind of a more stable way to grow in a, in a tropical climate. <clears throat> um, so this, like I said, this specific resort I actually have been going to for many years. Uh, and this whole area here, this had not been green like this. When I first came, this was all just sandy. Um, and what they've done is the, the drip irrigation that I was talking about, they put a lot of that in along these areas. And so you can conserve water and you could still irrigate. You can see it's pretty, pretty lush with vegetation. Uh, and that's mostly from that drip irrigation. They do some amount of sprinkler sometimes. You can see some more of this bamboo just kind of invading everywhere. 
uh, this area as well. Like I would say the whole area was more like this, uh, but they've made this big effort to, to bring back vegetation. Um, lots of areas that are forested, if they're near the old growth forest, they'll try to be bringing the forest kind of back into some areas. Uh, well, like I said, when I was going, uh, this is considered eco-friendly, but you're not really roughing it, you know? Like I got a little fridge, I got lights. Uh, there's solar panels on the, the roof of the building, so you've got power for an amount of time. It's a little bit more of Costa Rica. Um, I will show you more of this national park. Um, I mentioned that another big thing that Costa Rica did was this big public information campaign, right? They were like, that attitude was if people knew in general how important the ecosystem is uh, and how we're trying to preserve uh, a lot of uh, that natural heritage, if people just understood, then they would take care of it more. Uh, and when they started putting out these signs and whatnot, I just kind of figured people would just shrug and just keep on littering and doing whatever. But like people changed. Uh, it's been a very big change over the 20 years that I've been going there. As you can see, this is in Spanish and English because they also want tourists to read these. They want tourists to read these. So for example, this thing, uh, Costa Rica has a ton of hermit crabs, right? People have probably seen hermit crabs like at, at pet stores and stuff. Well, when you go near them, they, they cover up and stop moving, right? Because they don't want a predator to see them. So unfortunately, people will just be walking around and they'll just step on hundreds of these and just crush them because they think it's just like a rock. And the thing is, they're trying to blend in because that's their defense strategy is try to be still and blend in. But if you have hundreds of tourists going through an area, uh, it just destroys a bunch of them, right? Um, also, the, the turtles, right, that's kind of, uh, the area is more famous for the turtles because they come every year and whatnot. But again, big public information campaign to get people to basically not dig up the eggs, let the eggs have their own time and let the turtles come out eventually on their own. Things like that that you think, you know, why do people do that? Like, well, they just don't know any better. Um, and once they do know better, people, people act better. Um, Again, just showing how the roots really hold everything together. Um, garbage pickup too, like when I first started going to Costa Rica, there would just be litter and garbage everywhere. A lot of places I, I visit are like that, so I wasn't feeling like it was particularly bad. Uh, but they've really changed it up. And I actually asked my guide, I asked him why this dumpster, this seemed very unsanitary to me to have a dumpster that is like mesh. Uh, but he said because it, it's the tropics, if it was a dumpster like we have in Minnesota, it would just fill up with water and then like try to empty that out when it's filled with water. So although this seems less sanitary, this, it's better than that, right? Because that would just be a big putrid mess that would be almost difficult to empty out. This is a little school. Uh, the reason I took a picture of it is Part of that ecotourism package uh, required that a certain amount of money that's made from tourism go to school budgets. Uh, and so this little school is actually built with tourist money uh, over the time period that I've been, that I've been going here. Uh, as you can see, like all of your kind of normal, normal things you would experience in a little tourist town, um, a lot of local Local goods, the lizard visitor at night. Um, I would say, well, we don't study tectonics and stuff until later, uh, but the, the, the rocks, you could tell that this is an area of high tectonic uh, activity. Um, lots of volcanoes, uh, lots of earthquakes often. Uh, but we'll talk about the geology in a, in a couple couple chapters. This is the kind of the locals that hang out, uh, this type of area. Uh, a lot of monkeys. Monkeys can actually uh, cause a surprising amount of damage even to uh, their environments. Uh, so for example, often they'll have to be fenced out of places because they, they will, they're, 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 they're little bugs, 
that are in here. And they will destroy these trees to get to the little bugs. Uh, they'll break the leaves and stuff. Um, like I said, there's a little bit of the old fashioned type of irrigation. But again, you could probably just picture if you have hot sun coming into this, how much of it would evaporate away uh, before it actually nourishes any of the plants uh, versus drip irrigation. Um, because this was eco friendly, that means things like uh, well, your shower's outside. Um, the shower also wasn't heated water, but the tank was put on the, the roof of the building. So it wasn't like cold, like when you turn on the cold water in your tap in Minnesota in February. It's not like that cold. It's just not super hot. Uh, and you'll get little visitors while you're showering. And they'll give you um, like shampoo and soap that's that biodegradable stuff, right? That's like if you're in an eco-friendly place. These are the little ways you gotta tough it, but it's not really tough in my opinion. Um, like I said, a little bit more of the neighborhood. More examples of this recycling. Uh, like they do actually, they organize groups of people to go pick up trash. Um, and the, it's just, the place has been cleaned up in a way that I never thought possible. I'll put it that way. <clears throat> uh, local variety of squirrel. Uh, having to deal with much more treacherous terrain than our squirrels, I would say. Uh, like I said, the, a lot of organic places here, that's because culturally Montezuma uh, are a lot of people who are looking for a small ecological footprint. Um, in places that sell themselves as being eco-friendly. Um, all train vehicles are actually a bit controversial. Uh, the reason is because, well, they can actually tear up the land quite a bit. If there's not rules about where you could drive it, uh, you could really like hurt in a, your environment by quite a bit. Um, and I would say it was a mixed bag as far as Costa Rica and kind of the rules of, about these types of vehicles. Sometimes there'd be specific paths that you'd be able to use that way the destruction was kind of limited to a small narrow range, but there are other areas where people can rent them out and just kind of go wherever. <clears throat> like I said, big public information campaign really did change over the population. Uh, not the best precaution sign. Uh, this is what this town was like, uh, like 20 years ago. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot less tourism, a lot less going on. Um, so when we're looking at this region in general, um, some things that lead toward ecological problems is, is high population densities. Uh, now you can see in this that the population densities are mostly on the coasts, kind of depending on, on where we're looking. Uh, Costa Rica has a, a fair bump of population. I would say that's part of the reason why their suburban sprawl has kind of taken over lots of natural areas. Uh, the book focuses a lot on the Amazon, uh, and as you can see, like there's, there's not real population pressures here for the deforestation. I would say in the Amazon, the deforestation has lots of ups and downs through time. Um, the former president who lost an election just a couple months ago, uh, who's actually living in Florida these days, um, he and his political party felt that the, the rainforest should be cut down because the wood is a valuable uh, export, uh, could get a lot of good money. And he also felt that it was an unproductive use of land, the rainforest. I'm shouting out there. Um, well, he felt that it was an unproductive use of land. Uh, and I mean, I guess a rainforest doesn't bring in as much money as a cash crop, you know? Like this chapter talks a lot about palm oil plantations, right? Lots of places that aren't preserving their forest, uh, especially in uh, Indonesia. Um, well, they're, they're converting over to palm oil plantations and they're doing the same kind of slash and burn agriculture. But I, I will say in Indonesia, it's a worse situation uh, because a lot of the areas that they're slash and burning agriculture through uh, are on top of um, a, lot, a lot of peat. 
right? A lot of peat. What I mean is, so if you picture a swamp, right? And a swamp that exists for a long time, there's a lot of organic material there. And then imagine time goes by and that climate kind of dries out and then you get uh, a rainforest that grows on top of it, right? So when they're doing slash and burn, not only are they, well, they're cutting down the trees, trees don't take in carbon anymore, right? You're also burning the trees, so all the carbon stored in the wood is set into the atmosphere. In Indonesia, also that peak catches on fire. And so rather than switching it over to agriculture or something, there are areas that just stay burning for years. Uh, and all of that organic material that was laid down in that swamp over who knows how many thousands of years, as that is on fire, that is also released into our atmosphere, right? So it's all the storage of all this carbon from thousands and thousands of years uh, that just keep on billowing out uh, carbon and smoke. Um, just on the streets of Costa Rica, we have some things you might not might be surprised are in Costa Rica, uh, but it's developed. Uh, like I said, there's lots of sprawl, lots of kind of the normal things that you would expect uh, in more developed places. So let's see, we have a number of different uh, tropical rainforest characteristics. We'll put it that way. Um, talked about this, um, you know, actually, well, that's, that's simple. Um, these, these plants are actually quite interesting. There's a, a breed of tree that's called a strangler. Uh, and what it does is it will sprout next to, next to a tree that is a big tree, and then it will just grow around it uh, until it eventually takes it over and then kills it, and then it takes over where it was. And you can see it in the process, if you're walking around the forest, you'll see this, oh, this, this tree is being taken over by this other tree. Um, the vegetation can be quite aggressive in rainforests, right? Because it's a real fight for, for a struggle to survive. A big part of what all the plants are trying to do is to just get some light, right? This is one of the reasons why indoor plants, if you buy them, they're often from the tropics because tropical plants, you think to yourself, tropics that need lot, lots of sun. Well, they're usually underneath a thick canopy of forests and there's actually very little light that often gets down to the floor of the forest. It could be quite dark if you're ever walking in a forest. Um, let's see, rainforest soils. I've talked quite a bit about how the nutrients are leached out um, in general. Um, yeah, Indonesia, the soils are a bit better because they're replenished by some volcanic ash. Really depends on where in Indonesia. Indonesia is a chain of many islands and kind of has a large, large geographic range. Uh, this is a, a butterfly sanctuary. Again, in Costa Rica, they're kind of known for their, uh, their wildlife and their, their butterflies are included in that. Uh, there's just some, some eating fruit. Uh, again, another area that used to be forested is now grazing. Uh, you can't see it, but that's a, that's a sloth. Um, and now we've actually entered the, the national forest. Um, this is, so this isn't that monkey preserve anymore. This is the, uh, the tortugas, the, the national forest that kind of like everyone, everyone goes to visit um, well, we've got a chapter coming up talking about rivers and bodies of water. This is a good example of, uh, well, when I talk about that nutrients are washed out, you could, you could see how much stuff is washed out by, by basically the color of the water in places, right? If it's clear, there's not much being washed out. If it's uh, a dark color, that means a lot of uh, is being washed out. <clears throat> Um, when I've talked about the roots kind of holding the landscapes together, uh, back before modern agriculture, back when it was indigenous populations and they were uh, doing a lot of this agriculture by hand, I kind of was showing you how they would do different crops together. One of the plants that were part of the multiple crops were the trees, because uh, the trees were useful to keep, keep the landscape together. Um, and then there's, well, the, the process of actually making good soil was often human labor uh, because, you know, they didn't have 
modern day uh, fertilizers and things, right? And so they would by hand try to be grounding up the soil and mixing it in. Um, and I'll show you some examples of trees like this that they, they would specifically grow these to be dams to these areas so they wouldn't erode. Um, but with, but they're not really maintaining it anymore. Uh, this is an example of slash and burn agriculture. Uh, it's probably what you would have guessed it would look like. Again, just showing you how the roots hold the whole landscape together, right? Uh, so this tree, well, this whole area here um, is starting to erode, as you can see. This tree died, right? And so when a tree dies, its roots rot out. Um, and you could try to put up infrastructure to kind of do what the trees used to do, but it won't last long. Uh, because they just they're not as intricate, right, as a as a series of tree roots. Um, a couple concepts that are mentioned in this chapter, um, especially mutualism. Um, I mean, conservation is important too, but mutualism, coevolution of species that depend on each other for survival. That's when we talk about how much biomass are in these ecosystems. Uh, and about how if any one aspect is kind of taken out of that, it affects the other species by quite a bit. Um, so when we use a, a term like the jungle, actually, the jungle, the term the jungle, that is actually only accurate for areas of the rainforest where the vegetation reaches all the way to the ground. And so usually areas that are technically the jungle are areas that are like at the side of a river. Because uh, like I said, within the rainforest itself, the vegetation gets real thin as you go down because there's no light. Uh, all right, I'm gonna show you some examples uh, that our book specifically talks about, which is the trees that kind of can build these walls uh, in indigenous populations before modern agriculture, they would put these all together. And again, I don't, you, you, I don't know if you can see, but this is stopping erosion from happening, right? When rain happens and whatnot, this is kind of holding the land up. Uh, and when these are chopped down, uh, or if they die off with natural causes, usually if they die off, there's other trees that are adjoining. And so it's not that bad of a thing. You could have other trees come back. Oops. Um, but you see how they kind of like interlock with each other. Um, and they have that system where the roots come out, so they add a lot of stability. So they're very, very tall, right? And so if you get some strong winds, you need strong stability by having these thick, thick root systems. Uh, let's see. Do you see the see the wildlife in this picture? Too small to see? Seems a little better. That was, uh, he's very little, but that's, uh, that's an alligator that I saw down there. Uh, some were sloths, uh, probably because they're easier to spot because they're sloths. Um, so now I'm going up river. I'm going up river. Because uh, I wanted to see some of the locals and, and what life is like living in a, in a rainforest area and whatnot. Uh, yet another example of how much the roots are just holding the whole landscape together, right? Um, I think I mentioned this before about how there's kind of a... Um, well, every place wants to develop, right? Every place wants power and electricity, and they want internet access. Like, these are just kind of normal things that most people in the world want. Um, but putting in power lines, uh, well, because you have to keep that area accessible, uh, these are after, often avenues for invasive species to kind of come through uh, more easily than they would have otherwise without humans kind of creating a, a, a break in the ecosystem.
another root system holding the landscape together. Yeah. I'm just going to press on the keyboard to forward since the remote wants to only work sometimes. Um, if you see homes that are on stilts, that's usually a pretty good sign that, that there's a, a, a strong uh, seasonal change of rain, right? Um, I, we talked about the monsoon a little bit before. There are lots of areas that have a slight monsoon effect, so they'll get seasonal rain that's quite a bit, and then they'll be dry for a while. Um, building on stilts is a pretty good idea. Um, the other thing that works is if your home is floating, then whatever level the, the water rises or falls to, obviously your home won't get uh, inundated because it will just rise with the water. Like I said, going up river. Um, as I went up river, um, you kind of get further away from the city and more and more into the kind of the rural areas. Again, the color of the, the water, you can see how many nutrients being leached out. Uh, more areas that used to be tropical forested and now uh, feel, like, feel like a different biome, even though they technically have the same temperature, get the same amount of rain, feels more like temperate forests. Oh, that's right, I was going to not use this one. Uh, thatched woods, uh, very popular in these types of climates. Um, they're just what they what they seem like. You take bunches of leaves and you kind of shove them together. They could last five, ten years before you have to replace them. Not too bad. This is just in their restaurant, in their roof. Uh, more the cloud forest. Um, again, the roots and how much they're holding the landscape together uh, but also you could see these these don't have what we call good soil horizons we got a chapter on soils coming up but uh, soil horizons are usually the different kind of colorings whatnot and usually well in Minnesota very good soils so you have that black color very often for a good while before you get uh, different levels and layers in the tropical rainforest um, tends to just be that reddish color and it tends to just not have those different layers. Oh, that's right, another alligator that I did see very briefly. Um, lots of big spider web. This is like 30 feet in size, this spider web. Um, I would say, you know, you could see them when you're walking around during the day. At night, uh, have I, got, I told you guys how to how to uh, spot spiders in the tropical rainforest at night? Um, well, um, you know, you go out in the rainforest, you have a flashlight, right? Because they like don't want to 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 come across the monkey that attacks you or something. Uh, well, spiders have good eyes, uh, and a lot of them are nocturnal. Um, so you know, like if you have a flashlight and you shine it at a cat or dog, their eyes will glow a little bit with that reflection, you know. Uh, that'll just happen if they're doing the right angle. Spiders' eyes are like that, true. And so if you have a flashlight, but they won't reflect your eyes if you hold the flashlight here. You gotta actually hold the flashlight right here by your eyes. Uh, and then when you look out, you'll get little glowing, you'll see the thousands and thousands of bug eyes that are reflected back at you. Uh, unless you don't wanna see that. And then, uh, but then you'll, you'll end up walking through a bunch of these spider webs. And they're huge. <clears throat> like I said, big recycling. Uh, this is just a mall, just to kind of show you uh, that, well, they, they developed like plenty of other places, they're normal malls and things. Uh, lots of construction, lots of this economic growth, of course, puts pressure on the ecosystem, similar to here, where there's still areas that we're trying to preserve um, and lots of areas that are under pressure from development. Um, there's a section of the book talking about, again, it talks about the Amazon quite a bit, um, but it was interesting because there's, there's evidence uh, of a very large scale ancient civilization in the Amazon. Some of this evidence is uh, specifically that black soil that I was talking about. Um, a lot of that uh, in the world has come about through human effort. 
Uh, sometimes people just literally bring dirt from different places, but sometimes they, they work on creating the soil themselves, right? And so like, um, in Ireland, for example, for many years, the, the land in lots of areas is very rocky and you can't really grow stuff on it. Um, but what people did for many generations was there's a ton of seaweed and they would dredge seaweed up onto the rocks and then when the seaweed would rot, uh, well, they would dredge more up and then when it would rain, it would kind of wash the, the salt out. Uh, but that, that rotting seaweed over thousands of years became an actual workable soil in lots of different places. Uh, humans kind of do that whenever they can. Uh, of course, here in Minnesota, the good soil um, is mostly here. Uh, through natural processes. Uh, plenty of the soils around the world are. Uh, but again, this is, uh, like I said, example of the center of ancient civilization. <clears throat> so you talk about palm oil plantations. Let's see. Well, I'll talk about this other stuff too. Um, oh, like I said, so when you see <coughs> Percent of original forest, right, and forest lost. Um, you can see kind of recently deforestation uh, increased, right? The, the most recent president of Brazil, um, whose name I forget right now. But there's a, a new president who has a completely different philosophy, completely different philosophy. He's put uh, a number of indigenous uh, populations in charge of the forests that are where they live. Uh, and have told, given them the budget to defend it from loggers. Uh, completely different president, like just night and day difference. Uh, the former president was really pushing to basically chop it all down. Uh, he really wanted basically uh, to suburban sprawl through the Amazon. Um, the new president, completely different. As you saw from the population map, it's not like it has, they have po giant population pressures uh, to like cut down the rainforest. Um, and it's not the locals, it's not the indigenous communities who usually live in those rainforests who want to cut them down. They want that to be sustainable because they don't want to live there, you know? Uh, section in the book about uh, orangutans and palm oil plantations because, well, if you're cutting down a rainforest, right, because uh, so you're going to turn it into these palm oil plantations. Usually they just kill all the animals that are there, right? Um, well, people, people have special feelings about orangutans, and so um, people were a little bit more interested in preserving them and not having them all killed off. Uh, but it's one of those things where it's like plenty of people who are doing this and who are doing deforestation, they don't care. They would just assume all these things die, right? Uh, have not seen the politics change much in Indonesia uh, compared to Brazil. All right, keep going through our biomes, tropical seasonal forest biome. Uh, the main difference between this and, and the non-seasonal is, well, the seasonal tends to have a dry season. Dry season, it could be short. It could be like a couple weeks, a month. Um, usually they're longer than that. Usually it'll be like three to six months of a dry season. Some places even like nine or ten months of a dry season, right? In a very brief, not dry season. Those areas won't, don't build up the biodiversity as much, right? Obviously the places that have more rain for a larger percentage of the year tend to have more biomass, more biodiversity. Tropical seasonal forests here. Um, I would say, yes, extremely vulnerable to fire. The cl these climate areas are vulnerable to fire. Um, lots of the specific species um, have adapted to the fact that there's a lot of fire. Um, so they'll have very thick bark and things like this. Uh, but when people, you know, suburban sprawl into these types of areas, uh, and they're, they want a yard, and they, they want a house, and they want a garage, and they want a shed, and they build all this stuff that is just 
uh, very easy for that to dry out in the dry season and for it to all just burst into flames, right? Um, as far as human footprint on tropical seasonal forest, um, very often, yes, it is people who go into the forest because they don't, they don't have other resources, uh, they want to feed their family, uh, and so they'll go out, and it's not that they're uh, having anything against uh, the tropical forest, they often just don't have the economic means to sustain themselves. Again, like I said, it was a dry season, so the, the water level on was pretty... Oh, I would say also, the roads in tropical climates, the roads are very difficult to maintain. And I know we think that our roads are difficult to maintain in Minnesota, because we got freezing, and the freezing and thawing breaks up the roads. But in the tropics, like, a ton of rain just all the time, um, get lots of mud problems, uh, and, and having, having roads that are extensive are just very expensive to maintain. Uh, places are putting in roads and places are developing, uh, but it's, 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 uh, it's difficult. Um, and you also have in this climate, uh, like I said, there's lots of tectonic activity. This area of dead trees, this was an area that actually uh, just one day, one year, the land subsided a good amount. Um, probably was maybe an air pocket that has built up underneath, because you have volcanoes and stuff all over here, a lot of tectonic activity. Uh, and so it's not unusual to do, but all the trees that were in that area, they got salt water rushed in when the land fell, so all those trees died in that area. So that's why you have, and that's another classic thing that during the dry season, you know, this is an area that's likely to, to, to burn up unless they maybe do a controlled burn. Uh, but like I said, this wasn't, this wasn't human doing, this was, um, Area of, of large tectonic activity, I would say in general, any place that you have mountains at all, um, mountains are a good sign of tectonic activity uh, because, well, the earth is being pushed up at a rate faster than it's being eroded down, right? And wind and rain and everything else erodes the earth down. Uh, if there wasn't any tectonic uplift, uh, all, all of the earth's surface would have been eroded down and we would be be covered in an amount of water uh, everywhere. Uh, so tectonic uplift is good. You could even see the stratified layers of this bit of tectonic uplift from Costa Rica. Um, like I said, uh, there's, uh, ecotourism is kind of this in vogue thing lately, but a lot, of, a lot of places, I don't know what they mean when they say that it's, that they're, that they're watching out for the environment. Uh, if you, if you ever are traveling to this region and you see these these little these little boars, uh, they're very friendly. They're very friendly. Um, they will come up to you and you can pet them and stuff. You don't have to be don't have to be afraid. Just FYI, um, it likes to bury itself in sand. Uh, I don't know why. All right, everyone. Gonna leave you off there because got more stuff to cover. But just have you sign in for your points today. Just make sure your full name.